There are certain moves that have been perfected by certain wrestlers. Of course, for the arm drag, it's Ricky Steamboat. For the moonsault, it's Christopher Daniels. For the sharpshooter, it's Bret Hart. And for the spear, while some might argue for Goldberg, Edge, or Roman Reigns, for our money, no one's ever pulled it off quite like Rhino. Yes, whenever fans saw that the Man Beast was charging at an opponent, they knew it was game over. And that, along with a whole host of other in-ring tricks he held up his sleeve, has helped him to have a lengthy and successful career, one which continues to this day, in fact. Yes, from his days in ECW to his time spent in WWE and beyond, Rhino has been one of the best at his craft for well over two decades. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey so far in From Extreme to Impact, The Rhino Story. Terence Guido Guerin was born on October 7, 1975 in Detroit, Michigan into an Italian-American family, and it was there that he would spend a childhood watching pro wrestling on TV whenever he got the chance. So with that said though, it should come as no surprise that with his large frame and natural aptitude for athletics, the youngster would want to start training in the ring himself as soon as he came of age, with him actually traveling to Windsor, Ontario, Canada to do so, as he would learn under the tutelage of current Impact Wrestling Executive Vice President Scott Damore. And so, come March 10, 1995 then, Terence would be ready to have his first match, with him impressing some enough at this point that, soon after, he would get a number of dates with World Championship Wrestling, working as an enhancement talent under the name of Rhino Richards. And while he wouldn't get a job out of this, he was able to continue working as an enhancement talent for the big leagues when, from there, he moved over to the WWE where he would make other, more established performers like Henry O. Godwin and the Truth Commission look strong. All this while back on the Canadian Indies, he was forming a close bond with two other future stars in the form of Adam Copeland and Jay Riso, better known today as Edge and Christian Cage. But that wasn't all the rookie was doing because as well as that, he would pick up further reps in Germany when, in 1997, he would work dates for Catch Wrestling Association even going as far as to win that promotion's tag team titles with XL Legend at one point. Ultimately though, Terence would have to vacate these belts when he got his first big break just two years later, as it was then that he would fall under the eye of Paul Heyman in Extreme Championship Wrestling. Yes, with the stresses of financial difficulties and constant poaching away of talent beginning to take hold fully in the Philly promotion, Heyman was always on the lookout for a new star that could replace the ones he'd already lost. And so, when he saw what the Detroit native was doing over in Germany then, he was able to sign him up, from there rechristening him as just Rhino, a psychotic and unstable powerhouse who certainly lived up to the strengths of his namesake as he would routinely pummel his opponents to dust all before delivering a devastating gore, his version of the spear, to put them away for good. And this dominating manner would see Rhino quickly rise up the ranks of ECW, with him picking up notable wins over the likes of the Sandman, Tommy Dreamer, and Raven during his early months there. And as if that wasn't enough, come April 22, 2000, he would even beat Yoshihiro Tajiri to become the ECW television champion. After that, the newcomer started a full-blown feud with the Sandman, taking him on in a number of brutal hardcore matches over the rest of the year, and at one point even performing a gore to his opponent's wife Lori, this leaving the bloodthirsty 90s wrestling fans happy with the devastation that came in its wake. And so, with all this success coming his way then, it only made sense that before long, the Man Beast would be challenging for the ECW world title, something he ended up doing on January 7, 2001 as it was then that he would defeat his arch-rival the Sandman once more, taking home the top prize for himself in the process. Of course, most wrestling fans will know that this win unfortunately happened only a couple of months before ECW officially closed its doors, leaving Rhino with little time to establish himself as a proper champion before things went dark. That said though, during those couple of months, as Paul Heyman was desperately trying to keep his company afloat, the Detroit native did an admirable job of representing ECW and trying his best to keep interest going as he had good matches wherever and whenever asked. In the end though, there was just no saving the Philly promotion, and so after his final defense against Spike Dudley later that month, he would remain both the world and TV champions until Vince McMahon bought the company out later that spring. 
Luckily for the Detroit boy then, WWE would sign him up too soon after this, with the ECW champion making his debut for the New York company on the March 19th episode of Raw and quickly aligning himself with his old friends Edge and Christian as he did. And from there, the newcomer would further establish himself to this new audience by continuing to help his buddies in the weeks that followed, even being present at WrestleMania 17 to make sure they came out the victors during the iconic TLC2 match. After that, and he would cement himself even more by making a push in the singles division, starting this off with a big win over Kane on the April 19th episode of SmackDown to become the WWE Hardcore Champion for the first time then using the momentum of this title win to make it all the way to the semi-finals of the King of the Ring tournament a couple of months later, all this before ultimately being eliminated by Edge himself. And perhaps it was the loss to his friend that made him reevaluate his allegiances within the company then following this, as, while when the WCW invasion had begun that summer, Rhino had originally maintained his allegiances with Team WWE. Things would soon change when Paul Heyman was able to orchestrate a secret ECW reunion right under everyone's noses, with him bringing all his former Extreme alumni, the Man Beast included, back together on the July 9th, 2001 episode of Raw, then from there going on to form an alliance with Team WCW that would see both sides look to destroy Vince McMahon's promotion once and for all. And as part of the alliance, Rhino would now rise up even higher on the card, getting a spot in the inaugural brawl at July 22nd's Invasion pay-per-view, then having a notable feud with Chris Jericho, all as Stephanie McMahon herself sat in his corner. Of course, this feud is probably most memorable for the moment when the Detroit native gored Y2J right through the SmackDown stage on August 3rd of that year, but it also led to a pretty underrated match between the two at August's SummerSlam one which the former ECW champion would sadly lose in the end. Still, that didn't stop him from finding further success soon after, as come September's Unforgiven, he would have pinned Tajiri to win the WCW United States title, with him then going on to defend this for the next month, all before ultimately dropping it to Kurt Angle. And after this loss, so disappointed would his alliance stablemates be in him that they would actually kayfabe suspend the Man Beast, with this giving him a storyline reason to take some time off so as to go get neck surgery. When he finally did return on February 17, 2003 though, the landscape of WWE would be very different, as the invasion had long since ended by that point, with Vince McMahon of course coming out the ultimate victor. So now, with no more alliance to back him up then, Rhino set about undergoing a change of character as he began teaming up with Chris Benoit over on SmackDown turning face for the first time with the company in the process as the two went on to challenge for the WWE Tag Team Championships at WrestleMania 19. Ultimately though, they would not be able to win these belts, and it was this which partially contributed to Rhino turning on his partner not long after, costing the Crippler a United States title match, then from there making a claim to the belt himself as he set about trying to win it multiple times over the next few months. Sadly, he wouldn't be able to win this either, however, and from there, his momentum began to stall even more as he slipped down the card, doing little of note over the next two years as he moved over to Raw and turned face once more. And that ultimately was how things went right up until his release in April of 2005, with this abrupt exit from the company being his punishment for getting into a public argument with his wife at the WrestleMania 21 after party and embarrassing the company in the process. Yes, though he would make one final appearance with WWE at the ECW One Night Stand show on June 12th of that year, losing there to Sabu, this would be the end of his full-time run with Vince McMahon for the foreseeable future. And so, from there, he recalibrated by jumping over to TNA, the place he would make his home for the next five years. And now, as a full-time Impact competitor, Rhino quickly became eager to establish himself as a player something he would ultimately do as he went straight after the NWA World Heavyweight Champion Raven upon his arrival. And this even ended up leading to the new signing aligning himself with Jeff Jarrett as a consequence, with the two then teaming up to take on Raven and Sabu at the subsequent August pay-per-view Sacrifice, a match that would see the Man Beast pick up not only the win, but the number one contendership spot to the world title too. That was how on September 11th, 2005 at Unbreakable, the two former ECW alumni would face off once more to see who was deserving of being the top dog in the promotion. And though it would be Raven who ended up picking up the win by the closing bell, the performance put on by Rhino that night was enough to prove that he still had it in him to be a main event player nonetheless. So from there then, he would have notable feuds with the likes of Jeff Hardy and Abyss, 
All this before once again finding himself in the number one contendership position come October 23rd's Bound for Glory, with this being the event where, finally, he would be able to pin the then-champion Jeff Jarrett so as to prove that he really was the best in the company and a deserving world champion. Of course, after that the program with Jarrett would continue on for a while, eventually wrapping up with the Chosen One getting both his win and his title back come the end of the year. Still, the world title win had done a lot to reinvigorate the Detroit native, and so, following this, he would move on to a brutal feud with Abyss which saw both men absolutely annihilate each other, the whole thing climaxing in a match at February 12, 2006's Against All Odds, where Rhino would gore his opponent off a 15-foot ramp through four tables. And this would end up catching the attention of WWE as it turned out, because with them by then making plans to revive ECW as a weekly TV show once again, they decided they wanted to bring the Man Beast in as a key player. Not being impressed with what McMahon's plans for the hardcore promotion were, however, Rhino chose to turn their offer down, staying with TNA instead as he moved into feuds with the likes of Monty Brown, Samoa Joe, and his old friend Christian Cage the latter of which played off of both men's history together and came to a head in a violent 8-mile street fight at October 22nd's Bound for Glory. And as 2007 came rolling in, the former ECW champion next found himself getting into a lengthy program with AJ Styles, one which would see the phenomenal one turn heel and covered a number of matches in the months that followed, as each man traded wins back and forth. After that, it would be James Storm who would next fall within the Man Beast's sights, as after having beer poured on him by the Cowboy following a match a couple of weeks prior, Rhino would reveal in a sit-down interview that he was a recovering alcoholic, and that, as a result of Storm's show of disrespect, he was seeking revenge on him. And this would see the two meet a number of times over the next few months, the most notable of which was probably their barroom brawl at August 12, 2007's Hard Justice a match most memorable now for the pretty tasteless moment which saw the Detroit native knocking back some beers himself. Maybe it was best then that he would move on from Storm soon after this, as from there, he'd spend the next couple of years having mid-card programs with the likes of Raven and Billy Gunn, all while briefly teaming up with Christian Cage. Come the end of 2009, however, it was time for Rhino to make a return towards the main event picture once more, as he became a founding member of the TNA Frontline alongside AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, with this allegiance even helping him to get a world title shot against Sting at January 11, 2009's Genesis. Of course, he wouldn't win that match, however, and it would be this loss that would ultimately contribute towards him turning heel soon thereafter when, after growing frustrated by the progress of the new trainee he had begun mentoring around this time, Jesse Neal, he would turn on him in a rage, becoming a villain once more in the process. And so now, with a whole new host of potential babyface opponents then, the Man Beast started working his way through the ranks, with him most notably having a feud with Bobby Lashley at this point, one which would help get the Almighty to the next level en route to his eventual goal to becoming champion himself. Yes, as time was going on, Rhino's role in TNA was becoming more and more apparent as a legend that could get other, younger talent over. That said, he would get one more big storyline push while with the company as, in July of 2010, he would become a member of EV 2.0, a collective of ECW originals including Tommy Dreamer, Rob Van Dam, the Dudley Boys, and Raven who would come together to try and take over the main event scene over the next few months. And this eventually led to them getting their own pay-per-view on August 8th of that year entitled Hardcore Justice The Last Stand, one which acted as a celebration to the old Philadelphia promotion the stable had once called home and which would see Rhino defeat Al Snow and Brother Runt in a three-way dance. After that, an EV 2.0 would continue their mission to dominate TNA when they got into a program with Ric Flair's Fortune Stable with the subsequent gang warfare between both sides eventually leading to a lethal lockdown match at October 10th's Bound for Glory, where the Extreme Team would pick up the win. Just days later though, and the Detroit native's TNA contract would legitimately expire, with him choosing not to sign a new one at this point and instead work on a per night deal, something which soon became part of the storyline as, a month later, he would turn on his EV 2.0 stablemates with his reasoning at the time being that Eric Bischoff had promised him a new full-time contract should he do so. Ultimately though, Easy e would live up to his heelish reputation when, despite carrying out his part of the deal, Rhino would not be given a new contract and would instead be forcibly removed from the arena after losing a match to RVD at December 5th's Final Resolution pay-per-view, 
with this ending up being the kayfabe reason for his disappearance from TNA as, after that, he would leave the company entirely, instead choosing to spend the next three years working for Ring of Honor while also making indie dates and even appearing as part of New Japan Pro Wrestling's 2011 US tour. That said, he would end up making a brief return to Impact in 2014, establishing himself as a heel once more then as he helped EC3 to pick up a win over Bully Ray. And after that, he would continue to partner up with the One Percenter for a while, all this until the union eventually blew up of course, with this leading to a New York City street fight on the September 18th episode of Impact where the legend would do the honors for the up-and-comer. And ultimately, the reason for this loss was that, once again, Rhino was leaving the company, choosing to seek out other opportunities elsewhere at this time. Opportunities that would soon come in the form of a phone call from Titan Towers. Yes, in February of 2015, The Man Beast made a surprise return to WWE programming when he appeared on NXT, with him there helping to get the likes of Sami Zayn, Baron Corbin, and Finn Balor over. And while many at the time expected this would be his role going forward, as it turned out, there would even be one more main roster run in the cards for the Detroit boy, as come July of 2016, he would have returned to SmackDown, there forming an odd couple tag team with Heath Slater that was only supposed to be a comedy mid-card act, but ended up getting so over that by September 11th, 2016's Backlash, they would have won the Blue Brand's tag team titles together. Following this then, they would continue to bask in the wave of fan support, successfully defending their gold on a number of occasions against teams like the Usos and the Ascension, all before ultimately losing them to Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton in December. But this loss wasn't the huge blow it could have been for the Man Beast, because by then, he'd developed other interests outside of wrestling. Like Jesse Ventura and Kane before him, he'd decided to try his hand out in the world of politics. In fact, earlier that year, he'd even gotten Vince McMahon's personal blessing to run for the Michigan House of Representatives, with him following this up by running a campaign so successful that it eventually earned him a victory in the primaries, this making him the official Republican candidate for that November's election. Ultimately though, when the final results came in that night, Rhino would not get the seat he had hoped to win. Still, at least he would have the world of wrestling to fall back on as, titles or no titles, the act he had created with Heath Slater remained so over that they would continue to team up for the entirety of 2018, at one point moving over to Raw as they briefly went after the tag titles on that show too, as he didn't feel like he was being used to his full potential. So instead, he made a third return to Impact Wrestling that summer, from there, immediately setting his sights on Michael Elgin as the two repeatedly came to blows in the weeks that followed. After this, he would have a brief team-up with fellow former ECW member Rob Van Dam, all while having good matches against the likes of Moose, and outside the ring, announcing his upcoming intention to return to politics by running for Monroe Township Board of Trustee in his home state of Michigan. That said, this would remain on the back burner for the time being, as back in the ring, things heated up further when in July of 2020, he would really get something to sink his teeth into when his old partner Heath Slater came into the promotion, with the two from there teaming up once more under the goal of earning Slater a formal full-time contract. And of course, in the end, they would be successful in doing this, with the two now deciding that they were having so much fun that they would take their team out onto the indies as well, as they went on a trip over to Extreme Intense Championship Wrestling that October, and even won their tag team titles for a time. Since then, however, an injury picked up by Slater has led to his absence from Impact, and in this absence, Rhino had found some new teammates in the form of Eric Young, Diener, and Joe Doring the four calling themselves Violent by Design and going on to find much success together. In fact, on May 20th of 2021, Rhino and Diener would even become the Impact World Tag Team Champions together after defeating New Japan Pro Wrestling's Finn Juice, with this all being part of the open door policy that these two companies have been sharing alongside the likes of AEW, AAA, and the NWA. After losing those belts to the Good Brothers at July 17th Slammiversary though, tension began to build up within the stable, with this ending up being what led to the Man Beast being ousted from it a couple of months later, attacked by his now former teammates as he once again finds himself going out on his own. Where he will go from there, well, that remains to be seen, but with the wrestling landscape being the way it is today, we really wouldn't be surprised to see him show up in any number of places, always ready and waiting to deliver a gore to some poor, unsuspecting victim. So next time you're watching wrestling on TV, keep an eye out for Rhino, because you never know when he might just show up to lay waste to everyone in his path and change the game all over again.
Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.